Okay, folks, this is going to be a fairly short uh, introductory video. We're going to go ahead and um, start up a new game of uh, Global War 36 here. Probably tomorrow, it looks like, is going to be the, the uh, start date. And it's going to be a little different. It's going to be my first uh, experience, uh, Global 36, actually playing against um, an opponent. Um, most of my experience in Global War, um, in terms of actually having opponents, has come in uh, uh, 39, not so much in 36. So I'm a little uh, nervous and apprehensive to see how things will go. Um, but it's all going to be in fun, and it's definitely going to be a learning experience. Um, I am taking on the role of the Axis, and Fighting Irish is going to be the Allies, and uh, Global War 36 Enthusiast is going to be the Common Turn. So, um, and the operation is called Live and Let Die, after the uh, 74 Bond film which, uh, as a side note, happens to be my favorite uh, Bond movie. But, so we'll see how this goes. I don't really want to get too much into strategy um, with this video, just because um, we got to keep things as top secret as possible. So just kind of an over, you know, all, like, generic um, uh, plan that I have is... Uh, with the Axis, I want to uh, cooperate as much as possible between uh, the three powers. So um, I don't want to send Germany off um, doing their own thing, you know, Italy, you know, doing something different, and then Japan, you know, doing something different on top of that. So I think in World War II itself, um, that was one of the major uh, faults for the Axis was there wasn't really a lot of um, cooperation. There wasn't a lot of um, uh, strategy between the three powers. They each kind of did their own thing. As a matter of fact, um, a lot of times when one of those powers um, launched a major operation... The other two members of the Axis Alliance were completely in the dark that it was even going to happen. So, like, for instance, when Japan attacked Pearl Harbor, uh, the Germans were surprised by that. Same thing when Italy went into uh, Greece. Hitler was totally caught off guard. And then finally, when uh, the Germans invaded Russia, Operation Barbarossa, Japan also was uh, completely surprised by it. So... Obviously, it's going to be a lot easier to coordinate because I'm controlling all three axis powers. So that's going to kind of be an overall um, strategy I want to pursue is the three powers working together, um, mutually helping each other um, so that uh, the alliance as a whole uh, will would benefit. Um, the allies in World War II were much more successful. Um, there were several meetings with Roosevelt, uh, Stalin, and Churchill coordinating. Um, they came up with the Germany, Germany first strategy, kind of um, put as few resources in the Pacific as they could to keep Japan in check, but concentrate on, on defeating Germany first. And um, the Allies were much more successful, you know, coordinating and working together. So, again, just an overall kind of um, strategy is just going to be getting the three Axis powers to work together um, for um, a, the common cause, so to speak. Again, I don't really want to get into uh, specific strategies I'm going to pursue, um, but I'll definitely be interested to see the reactions of my opponents um, the couple of global 36 games I've played have been solo, so I'm definitely looking forward to see um, some different wrinkles and different uh, tactics and strategies employed by my opponents and having to uh, react to that. 
So that's kind of like an overall view of things. Um, to start out, obviously it's uh, pre-war. The only conflicts going on are in Spain, the Spanish Civil War, and then uh, the Chinese Civil War is also going on. Um, Italy is able to go into Abyssinia without um, triggering a major conflict. So the first several turns, um, I expect not a lot of uh, combat to be going on. I do need to, in Spain, obviously I would like to um, see Franco's forces emerge victorious. That's a victory objective or a victory point for both uh, Germany and Italy. So, um, but I don't want to, I've got a lot of other things I want to do as Germany, especially once uh, the general war breaks out. So I don't want to have to divert a whole lot of resources to Spain. Hopefully um, the die rolls go in my favor and I can send fairly cheap units um, to Spain, both from Germany and Italy, and that hopefully will be enough to turn the tide. Um, in my two previous games, uh, the German-backed forces did win the Spanish Civil War. Franco's forces did emerge victorious in both uh both games, but one of them, it was a fairly quick victory where Germany and Italy didn't have to uh, send a lot of resources there. And then in the second game, again, they came out victorious, but it dragged down for, I believe, three or even four or five more turns. And Germany, obviously, and Italy both had to send um, significantly more units there. So I'm hoping to avoid that. Um, just because, again, Germany's got a lot of stuff I want them to do once they do actually go to war. So they need most of their resources for themselves. Um, but we'll see how it plays out. I don't really plan on sending um, expensive units to Spain right now. We'll Again, we'll see how that plays out. Um, especially, I mean, Germany's collecting between 20 and once they annex their few uh, territories, in the first couple of turns, about 24 bucks a turn. So not a whole lot of money there. And Italy's only collecting $10. They definitely can't afford to expend, to send um, expensive units to Spain. So that's going to be the first place that uh, conflict's going to break out. And hopefully for the Axis powers, that's going to go their way. Um, as far as uh, the setup, this is the um, complete setup for the game. And just a little explanation of uh, the units that are on the board as far as the colors and what they represent and stuff like that. So for Germany, they're in black here. Uh, the French are the dark blue. The British are the tan. Uh, the Russians are kind of a maroon, um, lighter brown color. And then we've got white is going to represent all the neutral countries throughout uh, the globe. So that's going to be over here down in uh, South America, up into Central America with Mexico, a uh, few territories in Africa, uh, Turkey, Greece, Yugoslavia, Sweden, Norway, um, Switzerland, uh, the Baltic countries, all of those are in white. Now the orange I'm using to represent now, this is obviously pre-war, so these um, countries are not um, aligned to anyone yet. But uh, classically, Poland, Belgium, the Netherlands are all going to be uh, pro-allied and end up um, nine times out of ten um, being on the ally side. So anything that's in orange is, in essence, uh, pro-allied. Um, then the yellow that we've got... And that's Romania, Hungary, Bulgaria, Finland, and then the uh, couple of countries that Germany is able to annex, um, the couple of territories they're able to annex within the first couple of turns of the game. All those are in yellow. And again, even though this is pre-war, in essence, they're pro-Axis um, countries. So that's what I've got um, the yellow representing. And that also applies over here in the Pacific to Siam, which is... Uh, uh, basically pro-Japanese. 
Um, the Spanish Civil War, the yellow, Franco's forces. Uh, the maroon is the Russian-backed uh, forces. The U.S., we've got them in olive drab, uh, green. And then over into the Pacific, again, if you've got Russian units over here in the Far East, they're the maroon, brown. Uh, the U.S., again, olive drab, green. Now, the Japanese are in a burnt orange. You've got some lighter orange down here, which is the Netherlands, again, uh, basically pro-allied. Uh, the Far East Command is a combination of the British uh, darker tan and uh, light tan. I wanted to go all light tan for the Far East Command, but there's just not... Um, each country doesn't have all the units they need to be represented in the game yet, so um, you have to kind of mix and match a little bit. Australia is the darker gray. And then in the uh, Chinese Civil War, we've got the CCP. The communists are um, purple chips with um, a kind of purplish maroon um, color. Uh, the National Chinese, the KMT, are going to be the light green. And then the warlords I'm all representing as one color. That's the gray. And again, here we run into a little bit of difficulty. There's not, um, for instance, some of the warlords need like this mountain infantry or cavalry or militia. And there's not um, any of those units in the gray color right now. So I had to use um, units that normally would be for the KMT to represent part of the warlords. So all these other um, infantry units that are on the board in gray are the warlord territory. So um, not really confusing to me, but wanted to clarify that once the game gets started so that um, people know exactly what's being represented with what units. Um, hopefully um, for these uh, Chinese warlord units. I'm going to get some cavalry and some militia and some mountain infantry uh, painted gray so that um, they'll all be uh, color coordinated. As far as the chips, um, all the chips in my game represent one unit. So that's why if you've seen any of my solo uh, videos, you'll see stacks of you know 15 to 20 chips. I uh, don't use any chips that represent more than one unit. Again, just because I like to keep things color coordinated. Um, and I just think it looks cool. Really no uh, other reason than that. So any uh, stack that you see with a chip underneath it, that's going to be one more unit per chip. So for instance, in this uh, Chinese warlord territory, that's three chips, uh, three chips underneath the one militia. So four militia total. And that's going to uh, stay that way. Uh, throughout the game. Um, as far as I want to touch a little bit on uh, the representations um, for uh, the units in terms of the playing pieces, again, there's so many different units in Global 36, uh, such a step up really from any other game, at least that I know of, that's, that's out there right now. So there just isn't, every country just doesn't have a sculpt right now for each unit they could possibly use in the game. So you got to kind of um, mix and match a little bit. Um, I've used pieces from um, Axis and Allies uh, games, um, some other versions of Global War, just to try to flesh out as many of the pieces as I can. Um, and I've got most of them. I would say it's probably 90% or so, but um, a few pieces still... Um, are missing. So just as a, an example, we'll take a look over here at the British. So the British can have, uh, there's battleships in terms of naval units. There's uh, battleships, fast battleships, uh, heavy cruisers, light cruisers, battle cruisers, destroyers, uh, subs, coastal subs, transports, coastal defense ships. So a bunch of different um, naval units are represented, and that's in most countries have access to um, all of the same um, naval units, depending on you know what technologies they were able to successfully research and whatnot. So for the British, 
over here up in C zone um, 11. So that's the King George battleship that obviously represents a battleship. Now we got two cruisers next, and those two cruisers are from Axis and Allies, and I'm using those to represent heavy cruisers for the British. Then the next unit is another cruiser, and that's just a generic um, HBG cruiser, and I'm using that as their light cruisers. And then the destroyer is also from um, Axis and Allies, that sculpt. And then if you come down over here, um, we already talked about uh, the heavy cruiser and the destroyer. The transport it sculpt is from uh, Axis and Allies. The torpedo boat destroyer next is from HBG. And then this little gray uh, ship is what I'm using as the British coastal defense ship. Now, it's really small, so <laughs> it's not exactly... Um, representative of what the coastal defense ship would be. But again, there isn't any for the British right now. And the other, the sculpt that I do use for coastal defense ships for other countries, they just don't have in the British tan. So that is actually from HBG. Um, so that little ship there is their coastal defense ship. And then this over here, this first ship here in season 24 is their battle cruiser. And that is from, I believe, the uh, Axis and Allies Pacific. Not uh, Global 40, but one of the other uh, versions of an Axis and Allies game. So that's just kind of an um, example of having to like mix and match from a few different games to... Uh, flesh out all the pieces. And just as another example is, so this uh, big ship right here, this white ship here in Season 13, which is uh, a Norway, that is really what the sculpt for the coastal defense ship is. So again, maybe I can paint some of the white ones that I have tan, um, but that is what I'm mostly using for the coastal defense ships, except for in the case of, again, um, the British. And that's kind of, again, just an overall example. Each country really um, has uh, a bunch of different units from several different games just to try to um, successfully represent every unit in the game. It doesn't, it's, it's not all the way there. I really don't have any sculpts for fast battleships, uh, for instance. So um, if my opponent or myself happen to uh, um, produce a fast battleship. We'll just have to put a marker or something underneath it to represent that. Um, also, as far as speaking of markers, I try to um, stay away from those as much as I can. I like just having an actual sculpt for that unit. So I don't like to simply, uh, for instance, put uh, a generic infantry on the board and then put like militia underneath it or paratrooper or whatever. Um, that it that it's representing. So, and I pretty much successfully done that. I have sculpts for uh, like uh, the British commandos, the German Fallschirmjäger, uh, U.S. Marines, Japanese Marines. So, um, once we get into the game a little bit, and maybe um, some countries are producing those units, then um, they should also be successfully represented. And then, as you can see. Hitler, Tojo, and Mussolini are meeting here in Sardinia, away from the prying eyes of the Comintern and the Allies, discussing um, potential strategy. So um, we'll see what master plan um, the Axis leaders come up with um, for this game of global war. And then we've got the charts all set up. I don't have a chart for the common turn. It's the allies and the common turn are going to use the same um, board over here. And then the axis obviously have their own setup over here. And then finally, on the third board, we've got the axis, common turn, and the allies. And that's just going to be used to keep track of um, the victory points that each of the alliances um score throughout the game. So that's where we stand. 
We're should be kicking off tomorrow. Um, very excited. Wish me luck. I'm sure I will be making uh, plenty of mistakes. Um, each of these videos is going to be uh, different than um, prior videos that I've done. Um, again, if you have watched any of my solo gameplay, I usually or pretty much exclusively just do a recap of each turn. So I'll com I'll complete you know non -com purchases, tech rolls, um, non combat, combat, all that stuff. Do all that for each nation. Complete the turn uh, totally, and then just do a video and recap the action. But we're we're not going to be doing that for this game. We're going to actually be doing. Um, we're going to record everything that actually takes place on each turn. So, for instance, for Germany, um, they're going to kick things off. So I need to um, do my tech rolls, my purchases, um, you know, any non, again, non-combat, combat, all that stuff. And for each uh, combat that takes place, actually record each die roll. So uh, because of that, the videos will assuredly be longer than um, previous videos that I've done. Also, it's going to be um, a little bit more difficult, obviously, trying to hold uh, the recorder while um, moving the units around, especially once the combat kicks off and, and all that. So bear with me if the videos, if the quality isn't as good as uh, previous. Um, I we, we agreed, though, um, Global War 36 enthusiast and Fighting Irish and I all agreed that that was the best way to go to record absolutely everything that happens each turn. Um, not that any of us expect um, any uh, cheating or shenanigans to go on, but this will uh, pretty much eliminate that. Plus, for you guys that are watching and following along, it's definitely more in-depth, and you can kind of see exactly what happens step by step. So, that won't come into play as much through the first, you know, handful of turns just because there really isn't a lot of combat going on. So it, 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 that will really take effect once, um, you know, the general war uh, breaks out probably in 39 or 40. So this is the uh, little bit of the introduction to Live and Let Die operation kicking off tomorrow. We'll see you guys at the end of uh, Germany's first turn.